When, Where, and How Big An Introduction to Risk by Ted G. Lewis, Ph.D. Following the terrorist attacks of 9-11, former Secretary of Homeland Security Michael Chertoff defined a risk-informed decision-making strategy as a method of reducing the most serious risk facing America. He said, Within the critical infrastructure, key resources protection mission area, national priorities must include preventing catastrophic loss of life and managing cascading disruptive impacts on the U.S. and global economies across multiple threat scenarios. Achieving this goal requires a strategy that appropriately balances resiliency, a traditional American strength in adverse times, with focused, risk-informed prevention, protection, and preparedness activities so that we can manage and reduce the most serious risks that we face. But what does risk-informed decision-making actually mean? How do we measure risk? What do we do with it after we measure it? To understand risk, we must first understand probability and consequence. The purpose of probability theory is to predict the future. Of course, nobody can predict the future. We can estimate the likelihood of events occurring in the future. Using probability theory and a handful of other theories, we can get a handle on probability and eventually risk. The tools described in this series of lectures provide answers to questions such as, when will the next big incident occur? How big will it be? Where might it happen? To begin this journey, let's briefly review the history of prediction. We'll take you into new territory, into the land of random walks, levee flights, and the space-time consequence box. We'll examine predictions rise and fall as an act of God, define the different kinds of risk, and introduce a new way of anticipating future events. First, a short history of prediction. Remember that the notion of mere mortals being able to guess at possible futures is a relatively recent idea. Throughout most of human civilization's history, prediction was thought to be the sole province of God. Humans were not expected to be able to predict anything. Aristotle had a vague idea of determinism, the prime mover paradigm whereby the mechanical rules of the universe were set in motion by an event at the beginning of time. Everything that happened since, and in the future, is a direct consequence of the prime mover event. But that idea began to fall apart in the 1500s with the rise of gambling. How could a prime mover anticipate the toss of a die? How could unexpected acts from God be traced all the way back to the beginning? Aristotle's prime mover theory began to fall apart in the face of observation. A more modern idea was that events happen as a reasonable person might expect, but with some randomness or noise. That is, the future is approximately like the past, but with statistical fluctuation. These fluctuations might be reasonably approximated by the past using a posteriori probability, or by considering all possible outcomes using a priori probability. By the 1600s, non-deterministic models began to emerge as an explanation of observed reality. Thus, probability theory was born. Prior to Pascal's quantification of chance as an a priori probability, humans thought it was impossible to predict the future. Isaac Newton's laws of motion were too rigid to explain observations, but had a good run until Einstein discovered the probabilistic quantum world. Even Einstein was ambivalent and considered his discovery a big mistake. After all, why would God play dice? As it turns out, Einstein's big mistake is the basis of most of science today, including the best explanation for how computers work and how the universe was formed. <laughs>
Recall that a priori was the probability theory invented by Blaise Pascal in 1654. Pascal was a boy genius who invented and built one of the earliest calculating machines. Along the way, he invented probability theory. Pascal was inspired by the most famous mathematician of his time, Pierre de Fermat, who proposed the problem of the points as an unsolved problem. Pascal handily solved the problem by defining probability as the ratio of the number of ways a favorable event can happen to the number of ways all events can happen. The problem of the points was simply an opportunity to develop a general approach to problems involving chance. For example, in the game of tennis, what is the chance of coming from behind by two points and winning when the leader needs only one more point to win? Pascal solved this problem by formulating a very simple but important definition of probability. Simply let the probability of coming from two points behind and winning be equal to the number of ways the laggard can win divided by all ways the laggard and leader can win. This simple but elegant solution to the problem of the points established probability theory as a field that would consume mathematicians for centuries. Here's a simple example. Suppose we want to prevent a terrorist from doing some damage. Assume the terrorist must make four decisions without being stopped to succeed, while the law enforcement defenders must make three decisions in order to stop the attack. Like Pascal, we assume decisions are equally likely to be correct. Using Pascal's combinatoric math, the number of ways the enforcement defender could make all three correct decisions turns out to be 42, while the total of all possible correct and incorrect decisions comes out to be 64. Therefore, the probability of stopping the terrorist is 42 divided by 64, or 66%. Pascal constructed a list of all the possibilities to obtain the numbers 42 and 64. His list is called Pascal's Triangle. For more on Pascal's Triangle, see our lecture module, which covers the topic in more detail. The lesson here is to note that Pascal's a priori probability is simply a ratio of combinations. How we get the numbers is another story. Another hundred years passed before Pascal's definition of probability was challenged. Pierre-Simon Laplace, a French mathematician, astronomer, and friend of Napoleon, came up with a different definition for probability. Laplace ran into a problem that Pascal's a priori probability could not solve. Laplace's sunrise problem asks, what is the probability the sun will rise tomorrow? A simple question, but to answer it using Pascal's math would require that we enumerate the number of times the sun rises before it fails. We would have to predict the future to predict the future. Laplace reasoned that probability should be based on the past. That is, we can estimate the likelihood of a future event, such as the sun rising tomorrow, by observing the past. Thus was born a posteriori probability. Let n be the number of times all events, both sunrises and not, have already happened, and r be the number of times in the past that the favorable event, sunrises, have happened. Then the a posteriori probability is r plus 1 divided by n plus 2. Why r plus 1 and why n plus 2? Laplace argued that the likelihood of a future event occurring when it has and has not ever happened before should be 50-50. Even Stephen, equally likely. That is, if r and n both equal 0, 
then the probability should be one half or 50%. In other words, maximum uncertainty is 50%, because when we know nothing at all about the past, everything is equally likely to happen. Here's an example of an a posteriori prediction. What is the probability of a hurricane striking your house? To answer this question using Laplace's approach, we have to collect historical data. Suppose historical records show that over the past 20 years, zero hurricanes have struck my house. With this data, the probability of a future hurricane striking my house next year is 1 divided by 22, or 4.5%. Let's try that again on terrorist data collected between the 9-11 attack and 2012. In this 11-year period, 26 attacks were attempted and 3 succeeded. Plugging these numbers into Laplace's formula, we get 4 divided by 28, or 14.3%. The second ingredient in risk assessment is to estimate the consequences of a bad event. That is, we need an estimate of the size of an event, such as a power outage, terrorist attack, or hurricane. There are two fundamental approaches to estimating consequence. The single asset model uses either a posteriori or a priori probability to estimate likelihood and then historical data on past damages to estimate consequence. If historical data are not available, other techniques such as red teaming or subject matter expert opinion are used. The second approach is more elaborate. Systems such as the electrical power grid are systems of assets connected together in such a way that an isolated failure can spread damage throughout the entire system. A transformer fire can bring down an entire power grid by cascading, for example. For estimating system consequence, we need more powerful network analysis tools. In some systems, we need complexity theory to fully understand consequence. For example, box self-organized criticality theory predicts both size and frequency of catastrophic failures that magnify as failure spreads. The point is, consequence estimation is rather simple when dealing with a single asset like a transformer or building, but much more complicated when dealing with a system like a power grid or the internet. If we can measure probability and consequence, we can calculate risk using Daniel Bernoulli's formula. Bernoulli was a member of a famous family of exceptional mathematicians, engineers, and scientists. Daniel was a contemporary of Laplace, and much like so many of his contemporaries, he was also interested in gambling. His contribution to this lecture is what we now call expected utility theory, or EUT. Bernoulli defined risk as expected loss and calculated it as the sum of products, probability times consequence. Very simply, risk is the total expected loss obtained by summing individual expected losses over all events leading to consequences. This is a simple definition of risk, but finding probabilities and consequences sometimes becomes more difficult than it appears. Here's a simple example. What is the risk of a successful terrorist attack in the USA and a hurricane striking my house? In other words, what is the expected loss from the two possible events? To obtain the answer, simply sum the expected losses from each event acting independently. From the earlier examples, we know that the probability of a successful terrorist attack is 14.3%. In the USA, 26 attacks have been attempted, and life is valued at $6.3 million, so this threat has an expected loss of $163.8 million. Also from previous examples, 
the probability of a hurricane destroying my house was 4.5%. Assuming my house is worth $500,000, or $0.5 million, the expected loss due to a hurricane accident is $0.022 million. Total risk is the sum, $23.44 million. Note several important assumptions in this calculation. First, we assume complete independence of events. Terrorism and bad weather have nothing to do with one another. Second, we note that other assumptions may have distorted the numbers, such as assuming the USA rates for terrorism and hurricanes is uniform over the entire USA. My house is not in an historically hurricane-prone region of the USA, so the likelihood of it being destroyed by a hurricane is slight. There are a number of other objections to this approach to risk-informed decision-making that will be discussed as we go along. PRA stands for Probabilistic Risk Assessment, and it is an application of expected utility theory. This methodology is perhaps the simplest model of risk that can be applied in practice. PRA has flaws, but it is a good starting point. Norman Rasmussen is considered the father of risk assessment as it is practiced in critical infrastructure and key resource risk assessment today. He was a professor of nuclear engineering and authored the historical 1975 reactor safety study titled Rasmussen Report, in which he argued that nuclear power is less of a danger to people than driving a car. Ralph Nader debated Rasmussen on this point in a TV show in 1976, but that's another story. Rasmussen noted that risk is a function of three things. Threat of an attack, vulnerability of the asset, and consequence. That is, risk is the product of a threat, vulnerability, and consequence, or T times V times C. Indeed, this equation is used today in the Coast Guard's Maritime Security Risk Assessment Method, MSRAM, and CHDS's MBRA tool for calculating network risk. Threat T and vulnerability V are probabilities, while consequence C is measured in casualties, time, money, and so forth. Threat T is the probability an attack will be attempted. Vulnerability V is the conditional probability that an attack succeeds if attempted. How are these applied? Consider a simple example. What is the total risk due to three different types of threat? To calculate risk, R, consider the threat asset pairs shown here. The first pair is a bomb threat to a bridge. The second pair is a malicious computer virus aimed at a computer. The third pair is a fire at a power plant. Each of these threat asset pairs have associated values of threat, vulnerability, and consequence. Total risk is the sum of individual risks of the threat asset pairs as shown here. Rasmussen's PRA method extends expected utility theory by introducing fault tree analysis, as illustrated here. A fault tree is simply a picture of the threat asset pairs in the form of a tree. But fault trees add one more dimension, the logical relationships among pairs. Here we see a fault tree of the three threat asset pairs analyzed in the previous slide, but with a logical OR gate connecting them. This means that the total risk of this organized system depends on one, two, or all three of the threat asset pairs failing. Now, instead of independent failures, a small amount of dependency has been incorporated. Fault is no longer simple. It can occur because of any one of the threat asset pairs failing, or any combination of threat asset failures. Note that if a fault is possible only if all three threat asset pairs fail, the fault tree would have an AND gate in place of the OR gate. If a fault occurs only when 
any simple threat asset pair fails, the fault tree would contain an XOR gate. Thus, fault trees add a small amount of expressiveness to expected utility theory. What good is expected utility theory with or without a fault tree? The purpose of risk-informed decision-making is to minimize risk when faced with limited resources. That is, unless we have infinite funds, our goal is to do as much risk reduction as possible with available funds. We can do this by optimization, if we know how much it costs to reduce threat, vulnerability, consequence, or any combination of threat, vulnerability, and consequence. Here we see a formulation of the threat asset pair model with the addition of D, which is equal to the cost of hardening the asset. Hardening reduces vulnerability V, which in turn reduces risk. Therefore, this formulation of expected utility theory and fault tree analysis applies resources to asset hardening, which in turn lowers V. Using software such as MBRA, a mathematical optimization is possible, whereby a given budget, such as $50,000, is applied in part to each of the threat asset pairs to reduce vulnerability. The software finds the right mix of investments to minimize overall risk. Here's an example. Overall risk is reduced from $13,325 to $4,413 by allocating $50,000 as follows. Spend nothing on hardening the bridge because threat's only 1%. Spend $16,105 on hardening the computer because consequences are relatively low. Spend the remaining $33,895 on protecting the power plant from fire because consequences are high. In other words, one-third of the $50,000 is allocated to protect the computer, and two-thirds is allocated to protect the power plant. This allocation strategy minimizes overall risk. No other allocation is possible that reduces risk to $4,413, or by 67%. The earlier mentioned risk-informed decision-making strategy may leave you wondering if it's adequate. One threat asset was left unprotected by the optimal allocation strategy. Is this wise? What if the threat focuses on high consequence targets? What if high vulnerability invites attack? These are all good objections to the risk minimization strategy illustrated here. In response to these questions, there are two main points to remember. One, optimization assumes a rational actor model of behavior. The attacker will try to maximize risk. Two, diversion of attacks away from high-risk targets pushes attackers toward lower-risk targets, and hence expected loss is minimized. But what if the attacker is not rational? Then what? These questions bring what is known as the defender conundrum to the table. Attackers have an advantage because of asymmetry. They can choose when, where, and how to attack an asset or system. The defender cannot assume anything. On the other hand, the defender must defend against an unknown threat that can occur anytime, anywhere, by any kind of weapon. This means the defender must play the odds. As Sun Tzu says in The Art of War, Hence, that general is skillful in attack, whose opponent does not know what to defend. And he is skillful in defense, whose opponent does not know what to attack. By using risk-informed decision-making, the defender is minimizing expected loss, while not knowing what to defend.